Hello and welcome to this revision session for paper one in GCSE combined science physics. So in today's revision session we'll be looking at how to answer examination questions for GCSE combined science physics paper one. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson we should be able to answer GCSE physics examination style questions, assess our understanding on GCSE physics and understand what topics we need to improve upon for GCSE physics. So how should you prepare for this revision session? Well, when completing your work in this revision session, divide your piece of paper into two sections. Make the section on the left hand side larger than the right hand side. And in this section, write down your work and out and answers to the revision session. Now, when you're doing this, make sure you write in full sentences and show your full work and out. Whilst in the right hand side, in this section, write down any bits of information which you find useful or any hints and tips on answering questions you've gained from this revision session. And at the end of the revision session, use these notes and write them up into a revision sheet for you to use independently. So how should you be revising GCSE science? Well the first step is learning the key facts. So use things like revision guides, class books, prep notes and textbooks to learn the key ideas of the course. This might mean writing mind maps or writing out notes yourself. The second step should be to test yourself to retrieve your knowledge. So use things like Caboodle, Seneca and knowledge checkers to quickly test your own knowledge and you may wish to do this from cue cards. Then and finally, the third step is to practice. Practice examination questions. Use exam prep books, homework books, study books, additional workbooks to help answer exam questions and mark your own work. And you may wish to download your own examination past papers to do this. So the three steps of learning the key facts, then testing yourself, and then practicing exam style questions are how you should revise GCSE science. So let's now have a look at some past paper questions for the different topics in GCSE combined science physics paper one. So the first topic we'll look at is energy. So the first question says figure one shows a car fitted with solar panels. A person is cleaning the solar panels. When the roof is clean, the useful power output from the solar panels is not constant. Explain why. Then on one day, the solar panel received sunlight for five hours. The average power received by the solar panels was 1,200 watts. Calculate the total energy received by the solar panels. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, in this first question, you've got to understand why the solar panel is not providing, is not producing a constant amount of electrical power. And it's all because of the fact that the brightness of the sunlight that the solar panel receives is varying. And you've got to consider what factors that could be. And that could be due to the fact that the, the time of the day is different. It could be due to the angle of the sun in the sky or the most common one due to the cloud cover present. Now, you can't say the output itself from the sun varies. It doesn't. It's one of these three factors that makes the received amount of radiation from the sun different. Now in the next question you'll notice that it's worth four marks. So the first thing you've got to realize is you've got to understand that all the values are not in the correct units. So whilst the power is in watts the time is given in hours. So you need to convert five hours into the unit of time that we use in physics which is seconds. So you convert five hours into 18,000 seconds. At this point you'll know that the equation is that power is equal to energy over time. So we substitute our numbers into the equation and we say 1200 equals E over 18,000. We put the substitution in first so that we uh, can correctly do that. We then rearrange it to make E the subject which is 1200 times by 18,000 which is equal to 216000000 joules. The next question says the efficiency of the solar panels is 0 0.20. Calculate the useful power out when the total power in is 1000. 1200 watts and then table one gives information about two different types of solar panels explain why type 1a solar panels rather than type b solar panels are used on the roof of the car so you must include calculations from the data in table one in your answer so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, how would you answer this first question? Well, again, you look at your equation sheet and you see that efficiency is equal to useful power out over total power in. So the first step is to substitute the values in to be 0 0.20 equals useful power out over 1,200. We rearrange it to make useful power the subject, so it's 0 0.2 times by 1,200. The answer is 240 watts. Now, the next question is very important that you look at both the cost and you look at the efficiency. A good 
um, hint is when you're given a table in a GCSE physics exam paper, you look at each column separately. So the first thing to look at is the idea of the cost. So if you divide one, if you divide 12,000 by 1,500, the cost of each of the solar panels, you'll note that type B is eight times more expensive than type A. And then when we look at the efficiency, we can see that we can do 0.3 over 0.2 or 30 over 20. So therefore type B is 1.5 times more efficient. Now what you can say is the increase in your energy output from the efficiency is not worth the extra cost because one is eight times more costly but only 1.5 times more efficient. So therefore type A will probably be the most cost effective. And remember, you've got to give a conclusion with your answer. The next question says, a student investigated the bounce of a tennis ball. Figure 1 shows the equipment that the student used. This is the method that they used. Hold the ball at a height of 1 meter. This is the drop height. Drop the ball. Measure the height the ball bounced up to. This is the bounce height. Repeat steps 2 and 3 for different drop heights. So the main source of error in the investigation was measuring the bounce height. Explain two ways the student can make the measurement of the bounce height as accurate as possible. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, for these types of questions, you will be asked to look at practicals and see what the experimental errors would be. So you've got to think about what they could be and it says explain. So there's two, you could think about uh, what the actual error is and then why it's the case. So the first one is the idea that um, that you can't read the height correctly because you need to read the measurements at eye level to avoid parallax error. Another one would be the idea you've got to carry to practice drops, you know, approximately to know where the ball will reach, so you know where to be looking at. You could say that measurements for the height have to be measured from the diagram as indicated, the bottom of the ball, or you can have the top of the ball, but bottom is probably the best, best practice, so therefore the diameter of the ball does not affect the results. You could also discuss about how you could film the investigation and use slow motion or freeze, so you've got more time to actually work out the value or you could have to look at the idea that the ruler itself might not be completely vertical and so therefore give you an inaccurate value even if you do read it correctly yourself so then use a bit of equipment like a set square to ensure that the ruler is at 90 degrees exactly to the surface so it's completely vertical so the measurement you take is accurate the next question says, the student's results show that the bounce height was always less than the drop height. Explain why and use your ideas about energy transfer in your answer. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so here straight away it's about energy transfers and it's about how it's it's not as high as it would be. You always got to think that links into the idea of efficiency. So when energy is transferred, energy is always wasted due to um, some resistive forces. In this case, it would be heating. So some energy would be transferred to the internal energy of the surroundings. So if some of the energy is transferred to the internal energy of the surroundings, the kinetic energy store in the ball itself will be less after it is bounced. So when energy transferred then to gravitational potential energy as it increases in height that will be less as well so therefore um, the ball will not bounce as high the next question says, when the drop height was 1.00 meters, the bounce height was 0.55 meters. Calculate the gravitational potential energy of the ball when it was at a height of 0.55 meters. Give your answer to two significant figures. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, with this one, you've got to look at what the question is asking you to work out. The gravitational potential energy at 0.55 meters. So straight away, we look for our equation, and that is mass times by gravity times by the height it is at. So therefore, the mass is going to be 0.060 from the previous question. We saw that it was, in fact, 60 grams or 0.06 kilograms. We then multiply by 9.8 by the gravitational field strength, and then we multiply by 0.55, the height that it reached. So we get an answer of 0.3234. Now the question says give it to two significant figures. So you've then got to round it. And remember, the first uh, significant figure is the first non-zero number that you encounter. So no point that doesn't count significant figure because it's not a non-zero number. Three, our first uh, significant figure. So we start counting from that point. Three, two, three, four. So be 0.32. You then look at that the third significant figure to see if it changes the round. And it's at three, so it's less than five. So it doesn't change change how it rounds so it's 0.32 joules. Let's now have a look at some questions concerning electricity. 
So the first question says, a student investigated some electrical components. Give the names of the devices used to measure the current and the potential difference. Then the student investigated how current varies with potential difference for a fixed resistor. Draw a circuit diagram that the cir for the circuit that could be used. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, in this first question, you've just got to know what measuring devices are used for current and potential difference. Current is measured with an ammeter and, a poten and potential difference is measured with a voltmeter. Now, for a um, practical where you're looking at how current varies with potential difference for a fixed resistor, you need the following bits of equipment. You will need a power source, so most likely a cell. You will then also need a um, resistor, because we're looking at the resistor as the, th as the thing that's being uh, measured. We need to have a variable resistor in the circuit so we can alter the values of current and potential difference so we can take a number of measurements. We then also need a voltmeter to measure the potential difference and an ammeter to measure the current. Now you've got to be aware of where to put ammeters and voltmeters in circuits. Ammeters can go in anywhere in the series circuit, but the voltmeter must go in parallel with the device that is being measured, which is the fixed resistor. So the voltmeter has to go in parallel, and you can see that in the diagram. The next question says, when the potential difference across a fixed resistor is 3.6 volts, the current in the fixed resistor was 0.16 amps. Calculate the resistance of the fixed resistor. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, for this question, we've got to look at our equation sheet and see the equation of Ohm's law, which is V equals IR. At that point, we substitute our values into the equation, so, so 3.6 equals 0.16 times by R. We rearrange to make R the subject, so 3.6 over 0.16 is 22.5 ohms. The next question says, the student then investigated how current varies the potential difference for a filament lamp. Figure 10 shows the relationship for a filament lamp. Explain the shape of the graph. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so in this uh, particular graph, you've got to understand what actually is being shown and how they link together. So the idea is that in the filament lamp, you can just describe what's going on for the first mark, that as the current increases, well, what's then going to happen? Well, then there's more current flowing through the filament lamp, so therefore the temperature of the lamp will increase. You know this from just real world experience. Now, what is temperature? Temperature is how much kinetic energy that the ions in the substance will have. So therefore, they'll vibrate with a greater amplitude. Vibrate because they're a solid, so they won't be able to move. And with a greater amplitude, so they'll vibrate further. Now, this then causes more collisions between the ions and the free electrons moving through the material, the current. So therefore, if there's greater collisions, the, current, the electrons will not be able to move as fast. So therefore, the current will reduce, which you can see on the graph, uh, or the increase in current will reduce. Okay, And therefore, the resistance will increase is shown in the graph. The next question says, there's a current of 230 milliamps in the lamp. Calculate the charge flow in the lamp in a time of three minutes and give a unit. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this question? Well, firstly, you'll notice that it's worth five marks. So there must be an issue with something in the in the question. Either you use multiple equations or one of the units is incorrect. So straight away, it says 230 milliamps. Now, milli means times 10 to the minus three. So 230 times 10 to the minus three is 0.23. The time needs to not be in minutes, but in seconds. So it's 180 seconds. And we then pop it into the equation that I equals Q over T. So we substitute the values in and we get 0.23 equals q over 180 so q equals 0.23 times 180 which is 41.4 and the unit of charge you've got to be aware of is the coulomb the next question says, the maximum power that the mains can supply a house is 30 kilowatts. The maximum current is 125 amps. Calculate the potential difference of the main supply and then explain how a, cir a circuit breaker acts as a safety device in electrical circuits. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this question? Well, the first thing to note is what's our equation? And that is power is equal to current times by potential difference. Then we notice that the power is given in kilowatts, so we convert kilowatts 
10 to the 3 into the normal unit. So it's 30 times 10 to the 3, which is 30,000. So we say 30,000 equals 125 times by V. Substitute the values in first. Rearrange it to make V the subject. So it's 30,000 over 125, which is 240 volts. Now, how does a circuit breaker work? Well, if there's a fault in the actual electrical circuit, the current will be too large. Or you could say that there's a big difference between the neutral and live currents. So at that point, the circuit breaker is like a sensor in the circuit, which will then disconnect the live wire, which is where the energy is going through. So therefore, it doesn't overheat. The next question says, figure 5 shows how a cable is connected to the inside of a plug. The plug and the ca can cable connect a device to the main supply. The plug contains a fuse. What is inside a fuse? And what feature is in the wiring of the plug in figure 5 indicating the device is not doubly insulated? So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this question? Well, the first one is the idea of we've got to know just what a fuse is. So a fuse is a thin piece of metal wire which melts when the current goes above a particular value. And the next question is how do it's not, not doubly insulated? Well, again, another fact you've got to learn is if a device is doubly insulated, you do not need an earth wire because there's no point because it's already have a double insulation away from the actual, um, the actual case of the device. So because there's an earth wire present, it mustn't be doubly insulated. The next question says, a hairdryer contains a heater and a motor that powers a fan. Figure 10 shows a simple circuit for the hairdryer. The motor has a resistance of 550 ohms. Calculate the current in the motor. And then explain how the arrangement of the switches in the circuit in figure 10 ensures that the hairdryer does not overheat. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this first question? Well, we've got a resistance and we've got a potential difference. So we use our equation V equals IR. Once again, substitute our values in to be 220 equals I times by 550. Make I the subject, so it's 220 over 550. The answer is 0 0.40 amps. Now, in, this, in the next question, you'll notice because we're in a parallel circuit that the heater only operates when both switches A and switches B are closed. So that tells us something very important that the heater cannot be switched on without the fan being present so as a result it will be it will be careful so therefore it will not overheat the next question says the hair dryer is also protected against overheating by a fuse in the plug. Firstly, explain how the fuse prevents overheating, and then the hair dryer has a metal case. Explain one of the safety features that's needed in the cable connecting the hair dryer to the mains electrical supply. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. So in this question, you've just got to know how does a fuse work? So a fuse works link because it links into the current supplied into the circuit. So if the current in the circuit is too high, this will cause the thin wire of the fuse to heat up and then it will cause that thin wire to melt. At that point, the circuit breaks, should not the circuit, so it doesn't overheat. Now the next question, as we mentioned in the previous one, the other safety feature in the cable is the earth wire. So this tells that if there's a fault in the circuit, so the difference in potential difference of the um, the neutral wire and the live wire is too great. Well, therefore, it provides a low resistance path for the charge to move, reducing our risk of electrocution, allowing the current to conduct harmlessly out of the uh, device. Let's now have a look at some questions regarding the particle model of matter. So the first question says, a student investigated the cooling of some cooking oil. The cooking oil is, at a, solid, is a solid at room temperature. The student heated the oil until it becomes a liquid and the student continued to heat the oil to a temperature of 62 degrees Celsius. The oil was left to cool. The energy was transferred from the liquid oil as it cooled. The mass of the oil was 150 grams. The initial temperature of the oil was 62 degrees Celsius and the civic heat capacity of the oil is 1,800 joules per kilogram degree celsius calculate the temperature of the oil when 5400 joules of energy have been transferred and then describe one similarity in one difference in the movement of the particles in a hot liquid and a cooler liquid oil so pause the video now and then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer 
Right, well in the first question you've got to use our equation that energy is equal to mass times by the specific heat capacity times by the change in temperature. Now the first thing to note is it's 150 grams, we don't use grams in physics, we use kilograms, so 150 grams is 0 0.150 kilograms. We've got our heat capacity, we've got our energy, so we substitute the values in and we then rearrange it to make the change in temperature the subject by doing 5400 over 0 0.150 times by 1800 so the answer therefore is 20 degrees Celsius. So it tells us the change in temperature is 20 degrees Celsius and it's being left to cool. So if it's cooling, the temperature must be going down. So therefore 62 minus 20 is 42 degrees Celsius. Now our next question is basically pretty much asking us, okay, what's a similarity, what's a difference? Well, the similarity is all liquids have the same air movement of particles. So you'd say that they can freely move relative to each other, but the difference is that they've got different temperatures. Now temperature is a measure of how fast the particles are moving. So therefore the particles in the hot liquid have more energy, so therefore they will be moving faster than the ones in the cooler liquid. The next question says, the student continued to measure the temperature of the oil as more energy was transferred from it. And figure nine shows the results. Explain the shape of the graph. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this particular question? Well, you'll notice that in the internal energy of any, any object, there's two stores, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So you can see that the curve is, is originally going from 62 to 34 because the rate of cooling is decreasing, because at that point we're losing energy of the kinetic energy store and the temperature is going down. Now there's a horizontal line at 34 degrees because at this point the potential energy store is changing, so therefore the oil is changing changing state. So it is still losing energy out of the internal energy, but it's not from the kinetic store, so there's no change in temperature. Then it will cool down further from 34 to 20 degrees, because again we're losing energy out of the kinetic store, because we've now stopped changing state, and we're going back to change in temperature. And then at 20 degrees Celsius, it won't be changing state anymore, but it has reached room temperature, so at that point it's a thermal equilibrium with the surroundings, so therefore it'll stay at the same temperature. The next question says, the heater increases the temperature of air from 25 degrees to 60 degrees. A potential difference across the heat is 220 volts. A charge of 2,100 coulombs passes through a heater. Calculate the mass of air that's heated as a charge passes through the heater. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the first thing to note here that this question is worth six marks, so we're going to have to use multiple equations. So the first thing I note is that we've got potential difference in charge, and so we know that from our equation sheet that a uh, potential difference is equal to energy over charge. So we substitute those values in and go 220 over E equals E over 2100, so E equals 220 times by 2100, which is 462000 joules. We can then substitute that into the equation of E equals mc uh, change in temperature and then we can say so 462000 equals mass times by 1000 specific heat capacity times by 35 which is the change in temperature because it's going from 25 to 60 so the change is 35 remember the triangle in the equation relates to change so we can therefore simplify that by times a thousand by 35 and then rearrange it to make mass the subject so it's 462000 over 35000 so our answer is 13.2 kilograms. And again, after a complex calculation, we think to ourselves, is that looking like it should be the right answer? Well, 13 kilograms could be a possible answer, so it looks like it is going to be right. The next question says, a student investigated how the boiling point of water varies with the mass of salt added. Figure 5 shows how some of the equipment uh, that the student used the investigation. So plan an investigation that the student could carry out to obtain valid results. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, for these types of questions, when you've got to write an experimental method, you've got to think to yourself, what are you measuring, what are you measuring with, and then what are you doing uh, to actually get values, and then what are you going to do with the results? And those are the three main stages of writing an experimental method. Now again, it makes it very clear in a diagram that that's the equipment you've got to use, so always use those in your response. So the first thing is, would measure a volume of water, and you do that by using a measuring cylinder, so always state the measuring device. Devices. You then might measure the mass of salt using again a top pan balance. You then heat the water 
and record the temperature when the water is boiling and then add different masses of salt into the water and then see the different values. Now you've got to think to yourself, what am I going to keep constant as, as I've already discussed what I'm going to be measuring and with what. So you've got to use the same volume of water in the beaker each time and you've also got to stir the, the actual salt to dissolve it in the water and also ensure that the read on the thermometer is constant before you record the boiling point because you don't, because remember at the boiling point when it is changing temperature when it's changing state the temperature will remain unchanged now again look at what you've got to do to get a level three response the plan has to lead to a valid outcome all the key steps are identified and logically sequenced so you've got to talk about it all in the correct order now the next question says table three shows results so give two conclusions that can be made from results in table three so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer Right, so you can be given uh, data in, an, in a question in your exam and asked to draw conclusions from it. Now the first mark is going to give the general conclusion that the greater the mass of the salt added, the higher the boiling point of the water, which you can see from the data. But then you've got to drill a little deeper if you want to gain a second mark. So you should look at how uh, the, the relationship varies. So you can say that for each 5 grams of salt added, the, the change in boiling point increases by 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. So it's a linear change. We don't know if it's direct directly proportioned yet because we can't see the graph of the results. The next question says, water, water without salt was, at, was heated at its boiling point for five minutes. The power of the Bunsen burner was 1, sorry, 115 watts. Now calculate the maximum loss in the mass of water during the five minutes and then explain why the actual loss of mass will be less than the maximum value calculated in the question. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this question? Well, firstly, again, it's worth five marks, so you'll note to yourself, you're probably gonna have to use a couple of equations and look at the units as well. So we know that the equation, which we're probably gonna need to use, is energy is equal to the latent heat times by the mass, because we're given the latent heat in the question. Now we don't have energy, so we're gonna have to work out energy. So energy is equal to power ti uh, times by time. Now again, we're told in the question that it's five minutes so we're going to turn five minutes into seconds by doing uh, five times by 60 so the energy is 115 times by 300 which is 34,500 we then substitute the values into the equation of 34,500 equals mass times by 2.3 times 10 to the 6 we rearrange to make mass the subject by saying it's 34,500 over 2.3 times 10 to the 6 so the answer is 0 0.015 kilograms which looks a plausible answer for the values given now why would the mass um, be less than that value well again it's about energy transfers so not all all of the energy will be transferred usefully in this particular tra energy transfer. So some of it will not go to the water, but will be gained by uh, the internal energy of the surroundings. So the amount of energy absorbed by the water will be less. So therefore the mass that will be uh, lost will be less in turn. Let's have a look at some questions regarding atomic structure. So the first question says, nuclear power stations use fuel rods. The fuel rods contain two isotopes of uranium. Figure 6 shows how the two isotopes can be represented. Compare the numbers of each type of particle in a nucleus of uranium-235 and a, uranium, a nucleus of uranium-238. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so you've got to be aware that the bottom number on the diagram tells you the number of protons and the number at the top tells you the number of protons and neutrons. So you can see that both of them have 92 protons present. Now you can tell that uranium-238 has three more neutrons because there's 238 in total in the nucleus and 92 of them have to be protons, whilst uranium-235 has 235 in the nucleus and 92 of them have to be protons, so therefore uranium-238 has three more neutrons. The next question says, a teacher measured the count rate from a radioactive source. Explain there's a, why there's a hazard when working with radioactive sources, and then give two precautions the teacher should take when using radioactive sources. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. 
Right, you've got to understand what the danger is with radioactive sources, and that is that the nuclear radiation that they produce is ionizing, which means they can damage and kill cells, which can also lead to mutations and can also cause cancer in the human. Now, you've always got to know precautions you should take when using radioactive sources. Now, that could be don't direct the source to anyone in particular, handle with forceps or tongs, limit the exposure time you have to the radioactive source, wear disposable gloves, hold away from the body and move people away from the source and they could be also behind protective barriers. The next question says, a teacher concluded that a source was emitting beta radiation and gamma radiation. Explain how the number of counts per minute would change for different materials for this conclusion to be correct. And then the source used in the demonstration contains strontium-90. Strontium decays into yttrium. Complete the nuclear equation for the decay of strontium. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so how do you answer this question? Well, you've got to understand what materials will block out the different types of radiation. So you've got to know that alpha is blocked out by paper. You've got to know that beta is blocked out by metal. You've got at least metal and alpha is blocked by at least paper. And the gamma is reduced by, by, um, by lead or concrete. So the first thing to note is it's gamma and beta. So therefore, the counts per minute would not change with paper because they both go straight through. However, the counts per minute would reduce with aluminium because the beta would be absorbed by the aluminium, but the gamma would go straight through. So therefore, the counts per minute would then reduce with lead, not completely go to zero because not all of the gamma goes through to uh, can, uh, is absorbed by the lead. Some will in fact go through. So at that point, it will still then be reduced uh, further, not completely zero because there's also a background radiation present. Now the next question, you've got to know the decay equations for alpha and beta. Now you've got to know that the top line has to be the same before and after the after the uh, particular process, and so does the bottom line. And you've got to know that for a beta particle, the top line, the top part is zero, and the bottom part is minus one. So what has to be added to zero to get to ninety? Well, ninety. And what has to add to minus one to get to thirty-eight? Well, thirty-nine. So there is your answer. The next question says, strontium-90 does not occur naturally. Uh, in 2011, an accident at a nuclear power station released strontium-90 into the environment. Figure 12 shows how the percentage of strontium-90 in the environment will vary with time after the accident. Immediately after the accident, it was unsafe for people to live in the area surrounding the nuclear power station. Explain how the graph shows that it's still not safe. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, you've got a link in this question that the percentage of strontium remaining links into the activity of strontium, which then links into its danger. The more strontium there is, the greater the activity, the greater its danger. So you can say now that 11 or 12 years after the accident, that there's still approximately from the graph 75% of the original strontium remaining. So you've got 75% of the um, original radiation present. So therefore, the activity levels have not reduced by that much. As you can see in the graph there, you can see that's down to about 75% now so the levels have not reduced that much so therefore it'll take a much longer time to reduce to a much safer level where most of the strontium has then decayed uh, and reduced the safe level so that, that people can return. You can also mention because we know it's a very common uh, point to note that the half-life is about 30 years which is the time it takes to drop from 100% to 50%. So hopefully you've enjoyed this revision session and now you can answer GCSE physics examination style questions, assess your understanding on GCSE physics and understand what topics you need to improve upon for GCSE physics. So thank you very much for watching this revision session on paper one for GCSE combined science physics. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.